Britain's colonial rule in Ghana began in the late 19th century and continued until Ghana gained its independence in 1957. During this period, the British employed a variety of strategies to establish control and exploit the resources of the region. During colonial rule, Ghana was known as the Gold Coast. The British focused on economic exploitation, extracting resources such as gold, cocoa, and timber from Ghana. This was often done at the expense of the local population, leading to economic hardship for many Ghanaians. The British colonial authorities implemented forced labor policies, compelling many Ghanaians to work on plantations, in mines, and on infrastructure projects. This resulted in widespread human rights abuses with harsh working conditions, inadequate pay, and little regard for the well-being of the laborers. The British colonial rule also had a profound impact on the social and cultural fabric of Ghana. The imposition of Western values and institutions often undermined traditional systems, leading to social dislocation and cultural erosion. As nationalist sentiments grew in Ghana, fueled by the desire for self-determination, the British authorities responded with repression. Protests and uprisings were met with force, and political leaders advocating for independence were often arrested or exiled. As in Nigeria, the British implemented an indirect rule system in the Gold Coast, relying on local chiefs and traditional authorities to administer on their behalf. While this maintained some semblance of local governance, it also entrenched existing power structures and facilitated British control. While not unique to Ghana, these colonial practices collectively constitute a dark chapter in the country's history, marked by economic exploitation, human rights abuses, and the suppression of local autonomy. The repercussions of colonial rule continue to influence Ghana's social, economic, and political landscape. Hadley is an uninhabited land colonized. It defies logical reasoning that a region that belonged to no one and had no residential settlers would be colonized in the basic sense of the word. For this reason, any attempt to accurately narrate the colonial history of Ghana must start from the beginning, before the colonization of the region, as far back as the 15th century when the Gold Coast thrived. Like most African countries today, the present Ghana describes a nationalized country. However, before it was given the name Ghana, the Gold Coast was an umbrella term that described the various groups of people living within the coast, which spread to today's Nigeria and Sierra Leone, amongst others. Even more accurately, it was not referred to as the Gold Coast, until the advent of the British colonists in the mid-19th century. Before this, the region was at some point referred to as the Akan States, which land consisted of different African kingdoms, some of whose vestiges remain in present-day Ghana. One of such kingdoms is the Ashanti. The Ashanti Kingdom was one of Ghana's most powerful kingdoms. So influential was it that this kingdom was no less than an independent state and was found at the center of commerce and ruling power of the Gold Coast until its decline and ultimately loss of independence in 1896 following a series of wars with the British colonists. As can be rightly guessed, the first contact of the Europeans with the Gold Coast was for commercial purposes. 
The Portuguese are often credited with being the first Europeans to set foot on sub-Saharan African soil in pursuit of gold in 1471. On arrival on the coast of West Africa, the Portuguese traders set off their trading post, pioneering European settlements on black soil. What proceeded as more Europeans such as Britain, Denmark, Spain and the rest came to West African coast is none other than the infamous European transatlantic slave trade. Following the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, one would think that the act signaled the end of European influence on Ghana. However, quite the opposite happened. A few decades later, European countries would begin taking over rulership of African states, including the Gold Coast. These events dubbed as colonization led to the heart of our story, the British colonization of the Gold Coast in the 19th century. As mentioned earlier, the Ashanti Kingdom ruled most of the Gold Coast by staging several invasions, the first being successfully carried out in 1807. Their invasions were in a bid to expand their rule and to also protect and promote their trade. Hence, the Ashanti moved south in 1811 and 1814. These invasions were not particularly forceful Yet, they created disruptions in normal commercial activities as well as threatened the security of the Europeans. The impactful invasions left local European settlements such as the British, Danish and Dutch no other choice but to accept the rule of the Ashanti. However, it was not just the British who were impacted. Other kingdoms on the Gold Coast felt it as well. It is often said that a house divided against itself will fall, and so seems to be the case of the kingdoms in the Gold Coast. As expected of multiple kingdoms in the region, rivalry began to ensue between the different kingdoms as each sought to expand. Several kingdoms in the region, such as the Fante and Ga, who inhabited the new town of Accra, sought city provisions from the British against the Ashanti invasions, but the security they could provide was limited. It is uncertain whether this is the leading cause of discord that led to the British penetration, but one thing is clear. The coastal regions, particularly the Fantes, must have felt the need for protection by the British, leading to uncanny alliances between both and increasing the influence of the latter on the Gold Coast. As the influence of the British continued to increase, the purchased Elmina Castle in 1872, the last fort owned by the Dutch along the coast, thus making the Ashantis lose their trade outlet to the sea. A shocking turnout for the Ashantis, who had considered the Dutch as their allies for years. In a bid to prevent this loss and recover the revenue gotten, the Ashanti staged an invasion in 1873 that appeared a success until they came up against British forces with better training and they eventually had to retreat. The British eventually invaded the Ashantis in January 1874 to put an end to their reign, which resulted in the burning down of Kumasi, the capital city of Ashanti. In 1896, a final war with the British ended in defeat and ultimately loss of the Ashanti state's independence. With their strongest rival out of the way, 
the British had major power over the Gold Coast, and by 1901, they proclaimed the region as a British crown colony. Expectedly, the people of the coast were not happy with the establishment of the Gold Coast colony because they were not consulted before their territory was merged with the others. After all, it displaced the 1844 bond that was signed and treated every merged territory like it had been conquered. The British colonies had no right to claim their land as theirs, which explains why the coastal people did not have any resistance to doing so. Nevertheless, the deed was done and Gold Coast was now under British rule. The British authorities ruled the Gold Coast by indirect means. Traditional chiefs were appointed to care for the people, while the chiefs answered to British supervisors. One may wonder if the British colonists were not so interested in ruling their newly conquered land. But that hardly seems to be the case, as these colonists had strategically moved from commercial relations to social influence to direct ruling. The former Governor General of Nigeria, Lord Frederick Lugard, who pioneered indirect rule, opined that this form of rulership was cost-effective. In other words, the British could maintain power over the Gold Coast colonies with less British manpower. After all, not many Europeans found the living conditions palatable. What seems even more probable is that the British colonists, having learned from the uprisings by the Ashantis, adopted this indirect rule as a means of giving the Gold Coast inhabitants a false sense of familiar rulership, thus limiting any potential uprising against European leaders. While this had seemingly given Africans the opportunity to continue leading their people even while under colonialism, it soon became clear to many that it limited the overall participation of the masses in the decision-making processes of the government. By limiting participation to the appointed chiefs alone, the African leaders soon became semi-authoritarian in their leadership. After all, they were the ones with a communication line to the high-ranking British supervisors. A lengthened pondering on the flaws of this indirect rule probably awakened the national consciousness of the African people of the Gold Coast colony. Admittedly, the British colonization of the Gold Coast did witness the economic growth and social development of the colony. Commercial activities were scaled up through the introduction of new crops as well as large-scale production of existing ones. For instance, cocoa, which was introduced to the Gold Coast in 1878, had grown to become one of the main contributors to the economy of the colony by the 1920s making the Gold Coast the biggest world supplier of cocoa. Other products like timber and gold continue to flourish as exports of the colony. Furthermore, the British government saw the improvement of transportation routes on the Gold Coast, which fostered ease and effectiveness in engaging in these commercial activities in the colony. As a colony under British command, the Gold Coast shared a portion of the burden when the British Empire declared war against Germany in the First and Second World Wars. While the Gold Coast colony was obligated to provide the British Empire with manpower who fought in the war, this undeniably affected the population of the region. Brushing aside the black soldiers who died at war, the survivors had an even harder time reintegrating into society. Perhaps. The most lasting impact of the British colonization of the Gold Coast is Western education. In 1882, an educational ordinance was legislated for the first time. 
The ordinance was aimed at the promotion and assistance of education in the Gold Coast colony. However, it would seem that even the best things done by the British colonists were fueled by some twisted motive. While the general education of the Gold Coast natives was part of the plan, it was clear that the priority of the colonial government was to educate locals, particularly to be able to work in the administrative offices that had been created to foster colonial rule. Since British workers were too expensive to afford, the colonial government had one option, train the locals for cheap labor. Sadly, this is exactly what one would expect of Europeans who bought thousands of black people from the coast of Africa to walk their plantation fields in the 1500s. Contrary to popular belief, Western education had little impact on the Gold Coast society. Although young people were becoming learned English speakers, their learning could only function in the work environment already fashioned by the British government. Thus, aside from the ability to communicate with the British, young, educated Gold Coasters could not integrate their learnings into serving within the context of the African community. Nevertheless, in the 1900s, reforms were made to the Gold Coast Education Ordinance. In 1908, Sir John P. Roger, who governed the Gold Coast from 1902 to 1910, put together a committee to review the educational system of the colony. As part of the committee's strong recommendations for the inclusion of industrial training in the educational system, Sir Roger started both the first technical school and teacher training college in Accra in 1909. It is commonly believed that education is a light to the mind, and perhaps it is true. As more Gold Coast natives grew in character learning and Western education, the stage was being set for the manifestation of what seemed to be the British colonists' worst fear, the rise of an independent mind among the citizens. The independence of Ghana is one of the most important events in African history, not just because it is a story of freedom, but also because it was the first of its kind in the sub-Saharan anthology of freedom. The colonial rule triggered the national consciousness of many West Africans. Quite naturally, it should be so for no free-thinking mind would enjoy living in a systematically subjugated environment. As educated natives increased on the Gold Coast, the colonial rule became more unsatisfactory to their working minds. For example, in the 1890s, some of these educated persons came together to protest against the land bill issued by the British government. The continued push also created tension between the educated scholars and the traditional chiefs, the former believing in elective representative leadership as better for the benefit of African society. In 1920, an African council member, Joseph E. Casely Hayford, gathered British colonies in West Africa to select a delegate to present the suggestion to the British government in London. While this little defiance against the colonial government systems and practices persisted over the years, they became more tangible in the mid-1900s, after a series of events following the Second World War. Things escalated when, in 1948, three veterans of the war, Sergeants Ajete, Lance Corporal Atipo, and Private Odate Lampe, were shot to death by a British police superintendent. This unfortunate event led to the 1948 riots in Accra, a pivotal event leading up to Ghana's independence. The independent story of Ghana would be incomplete without six key players known as the founding fathers of modern-day Ghana and famously dubbed the Big Six. 
These six men were the founding members of the first nationalist political organization, the United Gold Coast Convention, UGCC, in 1947. They were Edward Akufuado, J.B. Dankwa, Emmanuel Obeshebi Lampe, Ebenezer Akoaje, William Ofori Atta, and Ghana's very first president, Kwame Nkrumah. Following the mother of the three veterans, the Accra riots started, leading to a state of emergency in the British Gold Coast, which saw many deaths in the colony. In a bid to control the chaos, on March 12, 1948, the British colony called for the arrest of the Big Six, the notorious political activists who were the voice of the independent movement. Perhaps the most notorious was Kwame Nkrumah. While the other members of the UGCC took a calm approach to activism, Nkrumah was a spark that lit the flames in the heart of the Gold Coasters. This resulted in his garnering of a mass following. This incompatibility in execution styles and other dissimilarities would later result in Kwame Nkrumah breaking away from the UGCC in 1949 and forming his nationalist party, the Convention People's Party, CPP. After the release of Nkrumah, a committee known as the Waston Commission was designated by the colonial government to investigate the justification of the riots. Surprisingly, the commission ruled in favor of the Gold Coast writing its constitution, supporting the desire for independence. Subsequently, Kwame Nkrumah won the election in 1951, becoming the first prime minister of the Gold Coast. He was 39. Five years later, Nkrumah motioned the call for independence again. Eventually, on March 6, 1957, the Gold Coast succeeded against the British, making it the first sub-Saharan African colony to gain independence. So trailblazed was the independence of the Gold Coast for Africa that within the next decade, many British African colonies followed suit bringing about massive independence of colonies. Whether concerning African heritage or for other unknown reasons, Kwame Nkrumah renamed the Gold Coast, Ghana, after the ancient African kingdom of Ghana or Wagado, which is now in present-day Mauritania. Ghana, which means warrior king, was the title of the ruler of the ancient African kingdom. Undoubtedly, if perseverance, grit, and strength were race, it would be African. The independent story of Ghana is just another one of the many African nations that have experienced subjugation and fought for the freedom of their land and people. The Republic of Ghana, like many other African countries, still struggles long-lasting influences of European colonization and its history of slavery to freedom must never be forgotten. <music>